So, a very good afternoon to everybody. My name is Simon Pickard, I'm the Network Director. To this expert workshop, our main theme for today is sustainable green recovery. Based industries in driving transformation and change in Europe. Today is a very important discussion. And Christian Ayler already in the plenary. Um, for a couple of reasons, I think. The first being that the bio-based industries in the last few years has really become a world-leading research and innovation, European success. And indeed, as we look at the, the European policy landscape and its objectives for the years to come. It will be potentially critical in a number of different areas, whether these are deal, the just transition, industrial strategy, and of course, the recovery plan following the COVID crisis. So let me just run you very quickly through the format of today's workshop. We have one hour, we will have a hard stop to round 115, and our objective is really to tackle one main central question. What must research and innovation and other policymakers do to ensure that bio-based industries are at the heart of Europe's green recovery in the years to come? Now, in terms of the, the flow of today's discussions, we have three expert discussants to start and stimulate the conversation, and we'll then move to a more interactive exchange with you and amongst the, the discussants themselves. Now, how do you contribute? Most important question. Essentially, it is through the group chat function that you see on the right-hand side of your screen. We invite you to, to basically table questions or requests for clarification or to make comments via the everyone list in the group chat. If you wish to address a question to a specific speaker, please put at the front question to Katia or question to Philippe or question to all. This is absolutely fine. My colleague, Jenny Lee, will then be filtering the questions and will relay them to me directly. And then we'll either just ask them directly in the conversation or I will invite you to unmute your microphone and make your contribution directly into the meeting room. OK, so we will spend about 15 minutes framing the topic for today with our expert discussants. I encourage you to start posting questions during that phase as well. So we have some fresh ideas to deal with as soon as we finish with opening remarks. And the main objective, why are we here today? Well, it is to, to try and develop three to five or a short list of high level recommendations for policymakers that can be presented to jean henri Paquet a little later in this afternoon's plenary sessions and also to fill some of our news coverage for the post-conference editorial view. Now, I should also note that the session is being recorded and therefore it is on the record, although science business policy, we never quote you directly without clearing it with you. So please feel free to speak openly and frankly, and we look forward to a very productive set of discussions. The footnote to that is that time is a little limited, so please be very practical with your inputs wherever possible. Now, let's move on. To our distinguished guests, we have three people who kindly agreed to give their time to kickstart this conversation and discuss or help us understand how bio-based industry can secure their place at the heart of the, the green recovery in Europe. First of all, we have Philippe Mangal, the executive director at the Bio-Based Industries Joint Undertaking, which has been very much driving progress in this domain in the last seven years as one of the Horizon 2020 flagship undertakings. We have Katia Bastioli, the Chief Executive Officer of Novamont, and Dirk Carrez, the Executive Director of the Bio-Based Industries Consortium. A warm welcome to you all and thank you again for joining us. And I would now invite you to unmute your microphones as well, as you're going to be speaking in a very, very short order. So if I can, I'd like to start with Philippe uh, and just set the stage, perhaps a few insights on what's been learned for the last BBI joint undertaking, and what you feel needs to come next. What are some of the, the key issues that, for you, policymakers need to be considering to advance the bio-based industries agenda in the years to come? Philippe, over to you. Uh, 
Thank you, Simon. Uh, good morning, and uh, thank you very much for the organization of this workshop. So maybe I should start by reminding uh, what uh, BBIJU is about. It's a public-private uh, partnership between the European Commission, uh, three DGs, DG Agri, DG Grow, and DG RTD. And the private partner is uh, BIG, the Biobased Industry uh, Consortium, representing the, the industry. BBIJU had a, a, an ambitious budget of 3.7 billion, 25% coming from Commission, and the remaining 75% uh, committed by uh, the industry. I think it is still the largest initiative funding a research and innovation program uh, in Europe for the, for the bioeconomy. The ambition at the beginning of both partners was to develop sustainable and competitive bio-based industries in Europe, and this based on advanced biorefineries that will source their biomass in a sustainable uh, manner. For, for that purpose, the, the research and innovation uh, program, which is implemented by the BBIJU, is based on the strategic innovation and research agenda developed by the industry and approved by the European Commission. Basically, uh, BBIJU had three main objectives. The first one is to de-risk investment in research and innovation, but also in industrial deployment. Second, to reach a critical mass and mobilize key actors. And the third objective was about organizing and structuring the value chain, which is key for this sector, which is still uh, very uh, fragmented. The current BBIJU just closed its last uh, call. Uh, it was last week, and the possible successor of BBIJU under Horizon Europe is called CBE, Circular Biobased uh, Europe. All our stakeholders know that European biobased industry sector offers huge opportunities of sustainable growth and is expected to be a key contributor to the European uh, Green Deal in different dimensions, including the socio-economic objectives. The Vision 2050 developed by BIC and 15 organizations representing the sector describe a sustainable and competitive biobased industry in Europe, enabling a circular biobased society by 2050. It is stated that sustainable and climate neutral solutions will accelerate the transition to a healthy planet in respect of the planetary boundaries and at the same time increase the industrial competitiveness. That's for the vision. And the perspective behind this vision is a name. It is CBE, Circular Biobased Europe, the possible successor of BBI under Horizon Europe Framework Program. But continuity is at risk because uh, where the ambition is very high, currently at the moment of this uh, workshop, the capacity to achieve it is not agreed yet. Capacity means the format uh, of the partnership, the financial commitment from both uh, partners, uh, and the capacity to uh, achieve it. Capacity uh, meaning all this, it, which is basically uh, the resources to do the job. Currently, to conclude, BBI is recognized as a success in mobilizing key actors of the sector, helping to structure value chain, de-risk investment, and contribute to make Europe an attractive area where to invest in bio-based industries. But we are not there yet. Uh, and there is still a lot that needs to be achieved in terms of biomass mobilization, in terms of biodiversity protection, safeguard of ecosystem, and the contribution to climate mitigation. So continuity is key, but uh, with some evolution, and evolution based on the lessons learned from the implementation of the current uh, BBI. So what CBE uh, intends to do is, first of all, to continue uh, everything uh, BBI is currently doing, in particular in finding high socioeconomic uh, impact uh, actions like demonstration and flagship project, and this while maximizing circularity principle. And this with the additional ambition of monitoring and sustainable uh, monitoring of sustainability, biodiversity, climate mitigation contribution, and safeguard of ecosystem, including soil and water management. Second, to deploy capacity with other sources of funding and the regional, including the regional dimension, maximize the synergies with other initiatives, promote, increase, and improve the participation of the primary sector within the value chain, and contribute to feedback to policy in order to contribute to stable, coherent, and supportive regulatory uh, framework. What is expected from policymakers is recognition, commitment, and mobilization. That's it from my side. I must unmute myself. It's the one thing we always forget to do in these events. Okay, so just to recap, 
Recognition, commitment, and what was the third term? And mo mobilization of all actors. And mobilization. Yeah. Okay, super. Well, then let's pass directly to, to Dirk um, on behalf of the, the Bio Industries Consortium. We talked before the meeting about some of the value chains perspectives, some of the challenges that you've encountered um, in the implementation of BBI. So let's hear from you now on what you think needs to be done to move this important agenda forward. Uh, thank you, Simon. So maybe just let me start by saying that, in fact, uh, as an introduction, yesterday uh, we just released an update of our annual study that we do together with the NOVA Institute uh, on the importance of the bioeconomy in Europe. And uh, the analysis uh, of the 270 Eurostat data, which are the latest that are available, uh, shows that the turnover of the total bioeconomy, uh, so including food and beverages and, and, and the primary sector, is at the moment 2.4 trillion euro in the EU28, which is an increase of 25 uh, over 10 years. And one third of this turnover is contributed by the so-called bio-based industries, eh? the sector we are talking about uh, today, so chemicals, plastics, uh, pharmaceuticals, paper and pulp, forestry-based industries, textiles, and so on. Now, these bio-based industries continue to grow, uh, we have at the moment a total contribution of 750 billion euro to the European economy in 2017, and this is a 7% uh, increase compared to the year before. So, bioeconomy is important, and we are sure that we can see in these results now the first results of, let's say, the impact of a possible partnership. Now, this doesn't mean that uh, we are there. Eh? Such, uh, if you want to have a further transformation of the European economy to a more green economy, this will require huge efforts and financing, as well public as from the private sector. So, first of all, such a transformation also means a strong uh, R&D and innovation in Europe. Uh, and so, we need a strong European, uh, a strong Horizon Europe budget. And we certainly already regret that European heads of state have reduced the Horizon Europe budget further, which is certainly not, at, I would say, a good signal to start with. But two, such a transformation of the European uh, economy can also only be done via what we call a systemic approach. Companies from different industrial sectors have to collaborate with each other to develop a competitive, innovative and sustainable bio-based economy. Uh, so thinking and acting in industrial silos, uh, sector only working, you know, uh, companies with, between them from a certain sector, this is really thinking of yesterday. Third, if you really want to obtain such a transformation, that will also require a dynamic, flexible, uh, strong partnership uh, with companies from different sectors, as I said. So in our case, this is from agriculture, forestry, agri-food, pulp and paper, chemical industry, technology providers, aquatic, energy, waste management, brand owners, so very diverse and also large and small companies, they all have to collaborate uh, towards development and the commercialization of new technologies, products and services. So these companies, and that's important in the bio-based area, they have to set up together what we call local value chains from feedstock supply to, uh, let's say, production and commercialization of products. And I would say, uh, as a fourth uh, element, such a transformation will also require acceptance to uh, experiment the technologies uh, and not to be perfect from the beginning. Uh, we have we are competing with, I would say, a more conventional industry that had the opportunity, luckily, to improve their processes over several decennia. So we should also be allowed to improve processes and sustainability over time and not uh, be forced to be the best already from the start. Uh, so now from our sector, technology is evolving uh, very fast. Uh, and so large companies and the more science-based SMEs, we certainly have to collaborate, uh, as I said. So the step from finding excellent innovative solutions and processes towards the testing and the application of the results in the, what we call a pre-commercial or even larger facilities is important. We call this in our case, the demonstration projects and the flagship projects. So to our opinion, uh, this should be a major role of a public-private partnership, focusing on deployment. Uh, and as such, we think that this partnership 
are also important to achieve impact. And if I call impact, I mean economical, social, employment, uh, environmental uh, impact. We have to invest in the translation of knowledge that we develop with our research into new innovative sustainable products and processes that are produced in Europe. Now, in the current BBI, as Philippe just explained, uh, and hopefully under the new proposed partnership, we certainly will carry on uh, what has been started uh, in 2014. So collaboration across the value chain, different sectors, different industries, together with academia, in bio-based projects uh, to find uh, good solutions and processes. But we will more focus on regional development uh, in the new partnership as we source the input material or the feedstock for these biorefineries in Europe uh, uh, and close to the production site. And finally, I would say last but not least, and it's also an, an important point, I think in the future our sector should and will have a strong integration of the so-called SDGs in bio-based products uh, and bio-based investments. We have to measure the impact of the projects, of the investments towards the SDGs. And this should and will become also an integral part uh, of a future partnership. Thank you. Very good. Thank you very much, Dirk. I mean, I think um, in terms of strong budget, systemic approach, dynamic, flexible partnerships, I don't think Mr. Paquet and his friends at PG Research would have anything uh, controversial to respond to that. But this idea about more flexibility and rapidity with technologies, patience, to build up the capacity and competitiveness over time and shift to demonstration flagships deployment. These are very, very good messages for us to perhaps go into a little deeper later. So with thanks for that, I'd like to pass directly to Katia Bastioli from Novamont. Now, one of the leading companies in supporting the BBIJU um, and driving progress in the sector. Katia, what do you see as the key priorities coming forward? Thank you. In the transition process, sustainable circular bioeconomy as territorial regeneration as, uh, and as interconnection among different sectors is a, a key tool uh, to curb disruptive phenomena, to guide the transformative process and to achieve resilience. In this effort, uh, the local dimension is absolutely essential. Novamont has been working for years uh, toward uh, a sustainable development model that is uh, rooted in the local areas and has built uh, a demo platform of circular bioeconomy in these years. Novamon started its activity as a research center. In 1996, as researchers, we started our business adventure with the idea to build an integrated value chain for bioplastics and biochemicals, going from soil to retail and to soil again, with research and innovation at the center, using a range of interdisciplinary skills and our patents to reindustrialize deindustrialized sites. We have in this way built five plants, first in the world, using raw materials from vegetable resources, as well as from organic waste and byproducts. The products we have developed and still are developing are conceived to overcome problems of accumulation of pollutants in water and mainly in soil. They are bioplastics, biolubricants, bioherbicides, ingredients for cosmetics, etc. Considering them as tools for redesigning entire value chains to make more with less, which is the, 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 the core of uh, circular bioeconomy. The Italian bioplastic value chain started with Novamont now is uh, a systemic Italian demo. A cooperation platform was born with composters and some municipalities for the collection of organic waste to the use of bioplastics, giving life to a model that today sees Italy in the first place in Europe for recycling of food waste, 47% of total against the European average of 16. This value chain has created a strong co-design effort with farmers, research centers, universities, and business partners from the plastic industry, and a lot of uh, clusters, uh, cluster of bioeconomy, agri-food, blue growth. We believe uh, that the circular bioeconomy must have at the center soil health and the redesign of all the streams of organic waste, solid and liquid, to produce high quality organic matter as a first priority. Because soil is a non-renewable resource and because the Mediterranean area desperately needs organic carbon. 
Notwithstanding this need, the recent soil directive at EU level, and more than 60 million tons of organic waste are going to landfill with impressive economic, environmental, and social costs. Instead, high quality compost could be brought back to soil with a double effect to regenerate fertility, maintaining biodiversity, and decarbonizing atmosphere. Organic waste is linked to food chain and food habits and can be a raw material for a range of innovative products. Food chain and organic waste, as well as paper and other areas, belong to the sector of bioeconomy, which is the central element to the functioning and success of the EU economy, with a turnover value of 2.3 trillions and accounting for 8.2% of the workforce of Europe. Europe is first head of China and the United States for the part of bioeconomy which is related to added value products. In this context, the sustainable exploitation of bioeconomy towards a circular bioeconomy in the shortest time possible is relevant for sustainability and for European competitiveness and needs to leverage from the, those innovation sectors and local value chains already able to give answers in the direction of the EU Green New Deal goals. And this is very important because we cannot build from the scratch. A systemic, transformative and multidisciplinary redesign effort is required correlating the energy transition to soil use, soil and water health, food production and security, and the pressure of anthropogenic activities at multiple levels uh, to solve the pollution problems and over exploitation of resources with the goal to, of making more with less. To conclude, I would like to mention three sectors where supporting measures have to be taken soon to activate the circular bioeconomy. The first is the adaptation and the development of innovative infrastructures for the recovery and treatment of organic matter and of other fundamental nutrients in the liquid and solid streams of organic waste. Second is investments in the sectors of chemistry, physical uh, treatments and biotechnology to widen the opportunities to transform wastes and byproducts as well as biomass from marginal area into sustainable products. The third is the support to territorial value chain projects and their innovative bioproducts bio able to interconnect a wide range of sectors. In this perspective, local demonstrators, flagships, lighthouses, living farms, and their network will be essential to learn how to build together and in an inclusive way, monitoring results on the field for a participated knowledge-based economy and an inclusive society without scraps. Thank you. Katia, thank you very much for those insights. And so we take away from that strong messages for policy around uh, around adaptation and implementation of new innovation infrastructures around organic matter, uh, treatment processing, manufacturing, more support for, for chemistry and bioorganic materials research, if I understood correctly, and value a focus on value chain projects to commercialize uh, byproducts across sectors from different food stocks or feedstocks and waste streams and an emphasis on flagships, networks, and local demonstrators. So I think we already have a pretty good basis to be moving forward on. Um, let me just take a, a couple of questions from the floor to begin with. We have one from, from Toshiyasu Ichioka at Bricken, uh, the Japanese uh, leading research institute. It's a question to Dirk. You mentioned uh, strong integration of SDGs as what needs to be done. Um, on the other hand, we've only got 10 years to realize them. So if integration of SDGs is not being done yet, within the partnerships or broader aspects of revising Europe, is this really an alarming sign? And any comments on that? And then a second question from Tatiana Schwaber uh, about the technology and innovation challenges for bio industries. Very fragmented sector, diverse feedstocks, decentralized processing. In what way is this turning out to be a benefit? when we think about resilience, quicker adaptations, changing conditions, and, as you mentioned, more regionalized and localized value chains. So perhaps, Dirk, quick comment on SDGs, and then Katia, Philippe, any thoughts on this question of the, um, the fragmented nature of the sector and possible benefits for the shift to regional value chains? Okay, Dirk, over to you first. Okay, 
I think that's a very good question indeed. Um, by the way, if I said we will have to integrate more SDGs uh, to the projects uh, and measure the impacts, that doesn't mean that in the current BBI nothing happens. So especially for the higher tier projects, so the so-called demonstration projects and the flagship projects, uh, there was always uh, an obligation, let's say, to to measure the sustainability or to follow the sustainability of the project, uh, including the environmental impact. Uh, but of course, this is, I would say, more limited. Today, I think SDGs are much higher on the uh, on the agenda. Though the difficulty is that up to today, it was always easy to say that these and these and these projects were good for SDG uh, five, six, and seven. But it was very difficult to measure the impact. So together with, let's say, a, a think tank of NGOs, we have developed a, a kind of guidelines on how to measure the impact of these projects to certain SDGs so that it can be used in an uniform way by the biobased sector. And this is what we have to be integrated now in, in the projects. Uh, so it's not only saying that this is good for the SDGs, but it's also trying to measure what is really the impact. And I think this will create a lot of credibility as well for the projects, for the industry, and for all the other stakeholders. We have also to speak the same the same language. Very good. Thank you for that. Now let's uh, let's talk about the fragmentation question. Uh, Philippe, Katia, or indeed anybody else who might like to chip in on this. Um, for the participants, please just comment in the chat if you'd like to contribute. Okay, but let's turn to Philippe and or Katia for a quick response on that point. Uh, Fragmentation, you know, we have to start from a different perspective, which is uh, the problem of natural capital and uh, which is at risk and in our territories, in our, in our local areas. And we have the opportunity to create integrated value chains at local level to put together from one side the regeneration of resources, created multi creating in the value chains, uh, local value chains, a, a multiplication of different uh, products in the value chain. So it's not just to produce uh, uh, in uh, uh, one crop in an uh, uh, extensive way, but to try to have uh, multiple products from the chain put in together agriculture, waste management, uh, industry, in order to create the value chains. This does not mean that uh, uh, the uh, added value chains are living just in the local areas because uh, there can be networks of systems, but uh, the point is that we don't have an economy without having a, a, a sustainable society. And this is the big challenge that we have in front of us, a sustainable society and a resilient uh, eco, uh, ecosystemic services. So uh, this is the aim of a bioeconomy. So we cannot continue with the system uh, uh, of the past, and uh, uh, if we consider just bioeconomy, not circular bioeconomy, uh, uh, we can have less fragmentation, but uh, we will have a big risk even more than fossil fuels uh, if we use in a massive way and uh, without sustainability in the center uh, the biomass. So, uh, you know, uh, the connection between society, natural capital, and uh, integrated projects is not a fragmentation, but is a way to create value in uh, uh, in the di different regions uh, and uh, looking at biodiversity, at diversity of economy, diversity of companies, uh, which is very important. Also, the biodiversity in the companies is important as well as uh, 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 you know biodiversity in nature because we need uh, uh, to, to to leverage on diversity and added value products and limiting the volumes and looking at the value. Yes. If I, if Thank you I, very much for that. Philippe, you want to add something? Yes, if I if, if I may add on top of uh, everything Katia already said, is that first of all, yes, uh, indeed, uh, the sector is very fragmented. I think I, I said that in my in my five minutes. That's also the reality of uh, Europe, the different type of uh, feedstock. So that's true that it's uh, more complex, it's a bigger challenge, but we are convinced that it will enable to to, to have a system more resilient and certainly more uh, sustainable. Uh, uh, Katia explained the, the case of Novamont. If I look currently in the portfolio of a project of BBI, uh, we have currently uh, uh, 10 flagship biorefineries funded, and they are located uh, from north to south, uh, west to east uh, of uh, Europe. One of it is uh, in uh, Sardinia for, for Novamont. 
And I can tell you that all of them are built indeed on a regional uh, uh, value chain. It's not at all the ideal uh, to build a model of biorefinery located uh, somewhere on a coast in an arbor, importing massive amount of uh, feedstock coming from outside Europe. Not at all. But that's true that it is more challenging. And again, that's exactly the model of bio-based uh, uh, industry. Uh, the partner European Commission and uh, big members want uh, for Europe. We don't want at all a model of uh, bio-based industry, as you can see uh, in Europe, uh, in the uh, United States, uh, for instance, mainly based on maize to produce uh, bioethanol, or the case of uh, Brazil, uh, mainly based on uh, sugar cane, again, to produce uh, bioethanol. But yes, it is more challenging, it will be more resilient, and it will also enable to have uh, more uh, biodiversity. Terrific, thank you for those uh, additional comments. Now, I'd like to um, touch on something we, we talked about before the meeting, but I think may also be relevant to quite a, a number of the people in the room today who are also at the, the cutting edge of, of research and innovation um, around bio-based uh, domains, shall we say. And it's the question of um, the alignment between what research and innovation policy promotes or pushes for and other aspects of the regulatory environment within Europe, whether that is you know, the, the, uh, the classification of waste streams uh, or biomass materials or, or feedstocks and how readily those can be mobilized between different parts of Europe. Or, for example, um, you know, the classification of bioherbicides as chemical products and how they fall into you know different regulatory categories that don't necessarily support their development or make it far more difficult to bring these kinds of bio-based innovations to the market so i guess the questions to you our discussants and to everybody in the room is are there significant barriers at the moment between re what research and innovation policy promotes and other regulatory or legislative agendas that make it harder to bring these innovations, the science and the technology to scale in different parts of the European market. Perhaps Katia, would you like to go first here? Uh, it's, uh, this is uh, an, a very important uh, issue, a very, very important challenge we have uh, in uh, circular bioeconomy because uh, uh, as uh, already mentioned by Philippe and Dirk, uh, there are uh, BBI uh, supported a significant number of flagships, and now there are many products which are available. Uh, this is, but there isn't a policy which is coherent with uh, this type of development. So, so uh, we have opportunities that we uh, like. Uh, let, let me make some examples. Uh, uh, look at Spain. Spain made uh, a, a new law on uh, uh, from starting from January 2021. Fruit and vegetable bags will be uh, biodegradable and compostable. But there isn't uh, any uh, uh, request for LCA uh, or uh, for uh, percentage or renewability. It means that this is a good possibility for bioeconomy, but in reality, uh, the chains, the European chains of renewable products cannot be uh, used to optimize also the climate aspect. So putting together this type of rule with uh, the uh, valorization of renewability and LCA, uh, it could create uh, more leverage. Or uh, in case of herbicides, uh, in the, uh, there are some type of bioherbicides at this moment, uh, which are uh, also uh, used in food, as food additives. So they are not critical for human beings, but the regulatory system at European level for this type of products is set on uh, very critical molecules. So to enter in this sector, even you, if you are ready, you take uh, uh, eight to ten years to have the first uh, productions. Or uh, and the waste. Uh, we have a biorefinery uh, in uh, in Veneto where we have a fermentation plant where the plant is uh, just uh, using sugars of different uh, 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 different uh, um, uh, uh, level, first or second generation, but. Uh, 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 the, 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 the sludges and uh, the, the digestate cannot be used in agriculture from uh, Ju June because we are uh, our sector is chemistry. There isn't a sector for bioeconomy. So APECO numbers could help to create a new sector which makes easier to use and the waste of this type of sectors in order to have uh, uh, maximization of uh, possibilities in this area or uh, single-use plastic directive. Uh, 
uh, you know, uh, it's very important to limit uh, single-use uh, uh, applications, but then uh, when it's needed, bioplastic could be easily used uh, together with paper. This is not the case. So uh, we have a, a cut of the system without having an evaluation of the potential that this type of sector can have in uh, chains which are already available and uh, spent sig significant investments. So I feel that uh, these are four cases, but there are many others uh, which show how we could leverage from what we have built. And in reality, uh, the risk is to create a crisis instead of, uh, of an opportunity. And uh, this is a shame because we are there already. Very good. Thank you, Katia. Um, so we have a couple of other questions. Uh, let's, let's go to a slightly more dynamic <laughs> format now. Uh, first, Peter Betts um, has a question which is about the capacity, uh, the realistic capacity of, uh, of EU bioeconomy. Peter, if you'd like to, to put your camera on and unmute your microphone, do you want to just ask it directly into the, into the room, please? Peter? No? Okay. Well, in that case, I'll, I'll quickly can, recap it. Can you hear me now? Uh, yes. Can, can you hear yes, me now? If you can just uh, sorry, I was... ask your question, Peter. Yeah, I was mu muted. Uh, I don't have a camera on, but um, yeah, I, I was curious if, if we have made, you know, as a group, as a bioeconomy group, the calculation on on, on uh, the, the limits of what we uh, what we can contribute uh, there, uh, based on uh, you know how many how, how much plant mass can we grow with the solar energy that we get, and and how uh, how far off are we in the EU, and and uh, because in 2050 we will be uh, at least with respect to the to the element carbon, the only, let's say, economy that is that is uh, that is circular, uh, by definition almost. So, how, you know, what what are the limits, and has anybody uh, been been doing research on that? Thank you. Thank you, Peter. And and let's take a quick second question from Steve Robertshaw at Across Limits. Steve, if you can unmute your microphone also bring a concise version of your question into the discussion. Steve? You still with us? Okay, again I'll just then I'll just recap it from the chat function. So Steve's asking, in the context of circular bio-based economy and society, how do we balance the environmental impacts associated with ICT, um, extraction, pollution, et cetera, all along the value chain, and the difficulty and cost of recovering resources from redundant ICT, and all the clear benefits associated with the, the advent of ICT in well reduced. The answer. So let's see if anybody has any particular thoughts or comments. Perhaps Dio or Philippe, you have any particular thoughts on? Yes, maybe I can stay of, of waste streams from ICT. Yes, if you can hear me, uh, maybe a few points about the, the limit of uh, bioeconomy and to remind some very important principle of uh, the initiative and the agreement between uh, partners. First of all, the feedstock managed by all the projects ongoing in the portfolio, uh, I think it is 98%, so it's all of them except uh, one on a very specific application. Uh, the feedstock is of course always uh, fully sustainable and it's mainly uh, side stream uh, waste and byproduct of the of the current uh, industry. So a, a, a few competition. A second very important principle, and I saw the, 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 the point in the chat, which was uh, what is the, the real capacity of the European bioeconomy uh, to prepare the post-petroleum era, so also including fuel. But that's not at all the idea that uh, biomass will be the solution uh, for a fuel. And first of all, the focus is really where carbon is absolutely needed. And carbon is absolutely needed for food and feed, of course, and, and it's linear, it's not uh, circular by, by principle, but it's in particular uh, material, fibers, and a lot of bio-based uh, 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 chemicals. Energy is always an element of a zero waste, of a very often an element of a zero waste uh, bio uh, refinery. 
and certainly uh, bioenergy biofuel will accompany uh, the transition but uh, in all the plan in all the, all the, the strategy developed uh, yes it is done taking into account uh, the limit of what uh, bioeconomy can uh, offer and uh, i am sure katia and uh, dirk can further comment uh, on it yeah, I fully, I fully share uh, the, the, the point because uh, uh, we need uh, really to have priorities and to make priorities in the bioeconomy. So certain things that cannot be done, uh, we cannot, uh, um, as I said, we need organic matter in the soil. This is very important because it's a non-renewable resource. So we cannot live without carbon the soil and then uh, to use it, the, all the biocarbon for uh, for energy because uh, this is not sustainable at all. So uh, we need to introduce uh, priorities in the concept of bioeconomy in order to be circular. So uh, 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 using a big bio and, and also in terms of uh, use of plastics, for example, it is not so, uh, sustainable to have a replacement one to one uh, plastics by bioplastics. Uh, we can, uh, if uh, the model of bottles uh, is not sustainable because we have a lot of bottles, it is not enough to put the bioplastics in the bottles. We don't have to do this. So uh, the point is that uh, uh, the products of bioeconomy are a, are a great opportunity to redesign the systems, to rethink completely the, the circle of, of uh, uh, organic, uh, I said, so, uh, organic matter in order to maintain clean organic matter. So we use uh, bioplastics when we have a risk to pollute the system of uh, soil and water, not uh, for whatever thing. And uh, we need to create uh, limits. So we have to use, le even if we use bioplastics, we have to use less bioplastics. So the concept of limit has to int be introduced in bioeconomy, in circular bioeconomy. Otherwise, uh, we have uh, an, a one-to-one -one replacement and we don't have resources. I remember Stern said uh, that uh, we don't, even for SDGs, we don't have uh, uh, enough resources to have uh, sustainable society and uh, regeneration of uh, natural capital uh, in a business as usual. So we have to reach, change completely the system. And bioeconomy is a great, circular is a great opportunity. Together with the missions, because we have to remember that uh, Europe launched uh, four, five missions, four of them are on uh, uh, challenges at European level. And uh, bioeconomy can be a fantastic instrument uh, to help uh, the goals of uh, the missions uh, together also with the uh, involvement of communities uh, in the innovation system, the participative uh, research activity. Thank you for that, Castia. I think that's actually a, a good sort of segue into a question raised by, uh, by Christian Lengers, which in the interest of time, I'll just quickly recap because it, it broadens out again to the the policy context and, and recommendations. So it it's essentially around um, you know how do we align the promotion of of circular bioeconomy with perhaps a slightly fragmented policy landscape within the European Commission, where we have DG Grow, which is sort of placing emphasis on on jobs growth production. You have DG Research, maybe looking for the advancement of new materials, whether bio based or otherwise, and perhaps DG Environment which is then essentially pushing with SUP and others to reduce production and eliminate waste. How can the different policy areas or domains work more effectively together at European level, in your view? And that's a, a question for anybody else who has a comment on this as well. But, uh, but Dirk Philippe, perhaps you might want to jump in first. Maybe if, if I can, just to start. I think it's very important because indeed when we start projects as, as in, the, in, in the area of the partnership, but also outside of the partnership as a company, these research investments will take uh, several years before the product comes on the market. Uh, but meanwhile, you know, policies can, can change very fast. Uh, and then uh, you are blocked. You cannot bring your product on the market, but you have done the investment. So what we really need is stable policies from the beginning that do not change, uh, I would say, uh, every two years, uh, but also coherent policies. Uh, and especially, you know, if I look a bit to uh, what's now on the table, even at, uh, at, at commission level, we have, of course, the bioeconomy strategy. We have a circular economy action plan. We have an industrial strategy. We have biodiversity strategy, the farm to fork strategy. And we really have to take care that, you know, these policies become coherent 
uh, that you don't contradict uh, each other in a different policy so that you don't start investments, you know, quite heavy investments to develop certain applications and products which are sustainable, but you are hindered to commercialize the product because of suddenly another legislation uh, that, that comes up. So uh, having a good communication, a good even collaboration, uh, not just like we do between different industrial sectors, but between, let's say, different uh, policy areas uh, is also important because otherwise it's, uh, uh, we are losing quite a lot of money investing in, in research and development that uh, we cannot valorize afterwards. Okay, no, that's that's a great point. And, and actually, perhaps if I can if I can turn to you, Philippe, because I, I want to make sure that we have a quick talk about investment as well, because obviously one of the the intended outcomes of the public private partnerships in the framework programs is increased commercialization of, of new technologies, even if there have been some concerns about the you know the non bankability of flagship projects in previous partnerships. Um, what are are some of the key messages to policymakers um, at EU or national level about keeping or even attracting more investment into outcomes of the kind of projects that you're supporting through the partnership? How do we ensure that, that more money is being invested in Europe to scale and prove the, the effectiveness of these new technologies or the integrated models and systems, as opposed to them being tested elsewhere in the world and thus potentially losing the added value to European citizens and, and economies? Uh, first of all, I would say uh, uh, improve or, or keep the favorable climate for our investment uh, in Europe, first of all, but by what was already uh, said in terms of a regulatory framework, uh, stable, supportive and, uh, and coherent. Now, let's look back where we come from five, six years uh, ago when it was decided to launch the, the current BBI. The situation in bio-based industry is that Europe was excellent in developing science and technology, uh, but very often failed when it was about uh, investment. Not that the investment were not done, but they were done uh, outside of Europe. And we have a lot of examples of leading European companies investing in biorefineries outside Europe. That's why in BBI, uh, as already said several times, uh, we can fund projects which are so-called uh, uh, flagship biorefineries. Uh, they are industrial scale and commercial scale uh, biorefinery, but they are first of the kind. I can tell you that this is already a very risky area, and these projects typically are not bankable. So the bank cannot uh, uh, accompany that. That's the European context. And that's why uh, all stakeholders in uh, BBI think that uh, those flagship biorefinery program was absolutely uh, essential. But again, we are not there yet. Uh, we have some of them in the portfolio, great, but there is still huge opportunity for development. So continuity again is key. But after the first of the kind, you have the deployment, the replication. And uh, there again, we think that we should have a, 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 a full mobilization of all sorts of funding, because then it's about several billions of euros that will be uh, requested in the, the, the deployment. The flagship biorefinery we have in the portfolio have been selected for the high capacity of replication, but the next step uh, cannot be funded by the BBI or the, the, the CBE in the, in the future. But all the partners are convinced that we need to have a, a system, a structure in place to have extra source of funding really to accompany the, the deployment. And so is this primarily, um, if you like, a, 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 a tactical or a strategic investment that needs to be made by member states or regions? in terms of more, more regional value chains and deployment and the scaling, with this being pooled at European level as sort of a collective source of insight and, and new technologies or approaches? But different actors, but structure in a way that uh, the industry that want to invest and deploy their activity, they know where to find uh, the good source of funding. It's about bank, European investment bank, venture uh, uh, capital, of course, uh, a region, but put in a in a coherent uh, a system. And uh, I know that within a big, they have already, I suppose, that's what uh, Dirk wanted to 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 point out, uh, an initiative to be ready to accompany this uh, deployment. Okay. If, if, I can add, the if I can add what what yes, of course, Dirk, please. I think um, for the further deployment, I think the BBI or the future partnership, I think the model 
is, is the first element, the model that we bring partners together to set up value chains. This is quite unique, I have to say, in the world. Uh, the fact that we can also uh, focus on higher tier is very important. But indeed, as Philippe said, you know, if we want to uh, stimulate the deployment even further in Europe, uh, then we have to do something more. And indeed, I fully agree, I think uh, the regions will play a, a crucial role. Uh, because uh, the regions, they know what kind of feedstock uh, they have, what kind of side streams. Uh, they are closer to the primary sector. Uh, and they also want to invest and uh, co-invest in local value chains because it brings employment and it bring, brings economic growth and added value to, for instance, waste streams. So indeed, what we have done to stimulate that, we have set up a digital platform with our industry members and the regions. And we have at this moment, I think, 120 regions all over Europe, east, west, north, south. And the regions can explain in that platform uh, what kind of uh, local value chains they would like to set up, what kind of feedstock, side streams, what kind of financial incentives they have. And the companies can explain uh, what kind of feedstock they are looking for, what kind of investments they would, li would like to do. Uh, because in the region, you can set up a local value chain, but you almost never have all the partners that you need to set up the whole value chain. And so we really try to do some partnering so that we can set up demo flagship projects, but even uh, replicate certain existing flagships in other regions uh, and really focusing and stimulating deployment in Europe of this kind of, of, of uh, value chains, but at a local level. So I think indeed regions will be crucial uh, in the future. Thank you for that. Yeah. Um, so before we move on to sort of a, a related question, I just want to, to mention to everybody in the room that, again, we're going to look to, to have a, a very short list of, of key ideas, very strong, concrete recommendations for policymakers by the end. If from what you've heard so far, you think there is one particular message or two particular areas that strike you as being extremely relevant, extremely important, please comment on that in the chat. We'll also keep a, a record of all of the, the remarks and the inputs that you give, which will help us in the, the formulation of messages for this afternoon and in the, the message afterwards. So in the last sort of 10 to 15 minutes that we have, please feel free to say, I fully agree on deployment and scaling or on regional value chains or whatever the case may be. Um, before we do, uh, I just want to pick up on, on one thing that you said, Dirk, which which is around the the idea of, of region, the importance of regions, but perhaps on a more potentially negative note, as Europe emerges from the COVID crisis with a very different scale of economic and, and societal impact, is there a substantive risk that we end up with significant capacity gaps in different parts of Europe around circular bio-based economies and industries? And if so, what should European policymakers be thinking about in order to make sure that we don't end up with a completely imbalanced system and capacity building being developed, supported and invested in, in the parts of Europe that perhaps are suffering more from the impacts of COVID than others? Maybe as an introduction, I would say even before the COVID, we had already, I would say, a bit a gap between uh, East and Western Europe, to make it very simple. I have to simplify it a bit. Uh, I would say most of the companies investing in bio-based innovation were uh, active, uh, come from, I would say, Western Europe. But I also have to say that the, the highest potential uh, often is in, to make it very simple, Eastern Europe, because of the biomass, the agriculture, of the food industry and the side streams available, but also because of uh, the availability of structural and regional development funds. Uh, and so we already had to invest a lot, and we certainly have to do it uh, to continue this, in uh, bring uh, these two parts of Europe uh, together to explain the possibility, the opportunity uh, in, I would say, the Eastern European countries. Uh, that's what we are doing. We are making reports uh, describing the potential, the feature availability, and we see that more and more members, and we have, I think, uh, almost half of the flagships today of, of BBI, uh, are maybe investments done by companies from, I would say, Western Europe, but done in Eastern Europe. Uh, so they are making the bridge, and this is creating awareness. Uh, and of course, due to COVID now, we have, I would say, 
Another gap, which is uh, again a bit simplified between Northern and Southern Europe, where the impact of, of uh, COVID has especially been very, very high in, in, in Southern Europe. Uh, and I think the opportunity now that we have is with the green recovery and the funds available that the support will hopefully mainly also go to, let's say, the more sustainable uh, areas. And normally, I would say, uh, by based should uh, normally profit and should be stimulated also in, in, in these countries. So, but of course, the, this also depends on, you know, how the regions, how also the member states uh, will, will implement this. So, but this is indeed a danger. Yeah. Katia, you're operating yeah. all over Europe and beyond. So how does this, I mean, I guess this plays out internationally and not just in Europe, but but yeah. please share your thoughts on it. Yeah, I, I feel that uh, uh, COVID uh, showed also the problem of, uh, uh, you know, uh, a certain level of independence, uh, which is very important, certain, raw uh, certain products. Uh, if we look at, uh, for example, uh, uh, feed for animals, uh, we are... Uh, uh, importing a big amount at European level, but we have also a lot of marginal areas uh, which uh, uh, are uh, desertified or in any case uh, polluted, etc. So it's very important to transform peripheral areas in strategic centers of development and it's fundamental to not just to look at the vegetable products uh, primary production, but all the waste uh, chains. So uh, there is uh, a, a big opportunity uh, coming from COVID uh, to uh, strengthen the local areas because we need to strengthen society, to, to strengthen uh, and of course uh, uh, the, uh, the poor quality of soil is very critical because uh, in, the one, uh, uh, in, a, in a small amount of soil we have billions of microorganisms and this is the richness of biodiversity and we are losing this. So, uh, COVID uh, is a demonstration that we are uh, fragile, we are not resilient, so uh, bioeconomy has to face also this aspect uh, at local level. So Green New Deal in this respect is a great opportunity for uh, to relaunch uh, uh, the, the regeneration of resources at local level after COVID, but it's also uh, and if we can uh, drive this type of uh, transition through bioeconomy, circular bioeconomy at local level with integrated projects, uh, we will have uh, from a big loss uh, a, a great opportunity of change. And if I may add very quickly on this uh, risk of, uh, yes. of the local yes. gap, is the absolutely need to have at member state level, but also at regional level, bioeconomy strategy. Uh, because the Commission has uh, recently updated the European bioeconomy strategy, uh, but the idea is not at all to have something homogene for uh, every member state and every region. So, but that's very important because it will help a lot uh, avoid this uh, this local gap, the risk of local gap. Very good. Okay. Well, we are coming to the end of our time, so we have the the unenviable task of trying to formulate three or four or five key points. Um, this has been a, an extremely rich and wide-ranging discussion. Um, so, I mean, some of the ones that, uh, that of course, stand out in terms of what I've heard, um, it's around the, you know, the importance of policy recognition and coherent, stable commitments to developing uh, circular bio-based industries through R&D over time. Um, I think the mobilization of, of multiple stakeholders around this is, is another important aspect. Um, there is also the importance of bio-based or circular bio-based approaches being prioritized in Horizon Europe. Um, a strong call to shift towards demonstration and flagship projects in deployment and in scaling um, and the translation of knowledge into products and processes and wherever possible to remove some of the regulatory barriers or complexity around that. Um, investment in more infrastructure around organic matter treatment, um, more research on, uh, on chemistry or chemical fields and bioorganic domains, and I think importantly, strong and consistent investment in value chain projects um, in different parts of Europe which again go hand in hand with the wider commitments to SDGs, to biodiversity, to circular economy strategy and plastics, 
Um, and I guess the, the overarching message is please connect the dots and avoid duplication or contradiction at a policy level wherever this is possible. Um, so let me let me turn it back to our, our three speakers, Dirk, Philippe, Katia. Are there any among those that, that you say these are really top priority um, or, or others from the conversation that you would say if the Commission is going to do anything in the next year or two, as we prepare to launch Horizon Europe, as we go from strategic planning to implementation, as the new partnership takes form and shape, this is what they have to. This is what they have to do. Uh, from my side, I feel that the, as I said many times, is to have a concentration on uh, soil, and so the new. Uh, um, uh, the uh, uh, legislation on, uh, on agriculture is very, very important from this point of view, and uh, treatment of organic waste. So the network of plants uh, of organic waste treatment uh, is very, very important, and uh, we have uh, in 2023 the new directive on bio-waste, which will oblige not to put any more organic waste in, uh, in a land, in a landfill. I feel this is a great opportunity to unify all Europe uh, on, from this side and not to have uh, organic waste wasted uh, but uh, brought back uh, to uh, soil and uh, biomethane etc and so to transform a uh, a fantastic opportunity for soil in not, not to transform in uh, in a waste this is what we are doing today and this is the priority if we are not able to be circular even in organic waste uh, what to do we, we will not have any chance for europe so i feel this uh, this is uh, the uh, first step where to start uh, to, to start and this is linked to, to agriculture and uh, to the big problem because we have areas of europe which are uh, under the certification moment or uh, polluted or uh, eroded okay. we cannot do this okay perfect that's so that's a great scenario. Let's let's turn to you next. Any things that for you are really top of the agenda? For me, okay. Um, so I think important is um, first of all to continue what Ka what Katia said, uh, but also the waste collection. I think, for instance, if you look to the food waste uh, at the moment, we only collect in general in Europe 15% of what is uh, theoretically, you know, uh, the potential. So. Uh, improving the food co waste collection so that we can use it is uh, is very important second element of course is uh, the whole focus on deployment i think uh, the bbi is the only or the partnerships is the only instrument in europe at the moment that is also supporting deployment uh, so we really have to continue if we're losing these and companies we go again outside of europe for the deployment and i would say the third element as i said is the coherent policies from the beginning you know if we have projects uh, or results from projects that cannot be commercialized at a certain moment, this is also hindering or demotivating companies to participate in innovation uh, in Europe. Perfect. And there's, uh, there's actually a final comment from, uh, from Tatiana Schwabe at, uh, at CLIB, which, which kind of endorses that, which is that so much in Europe follows from coherent and clear European policy directions. Right, whether it's on a funding strategy or a research and innovation policy, um, the EU leads and member states frequently follow. So, last word to Philippe. What, what, else, like can, to, what else can I add on top message, of what Dirk and Katja said? Continuity, uh, commitment, uh, stability, uh, uh, and supportive regulatory uh, framework, but really nothing else to be added. I think the key messages were passed already. Okay. Super. Well, on that, uh, we've run a couple of minutes over time, but I think it was worth it. So with that, I'd very much like to thank uh, Dirk, Katia, and in particular Philippe and BBI for supporting this workshop. Thank you for all of you for taking the time to join us and for your very contribution. If you follow the, the session later on this afternoon with Monsieur Paquet, some of this we decided exactly what is going to be uh, is going to be raised with John Eric Paquet, Director General of DG Research, and there will be news coverage to follow um, shortly after the conference, including a dedicated news story on this session. Um, final comment in closing is to say that if you wish to use the the B two B platform that has been supporting today's workshops, you can do so for another forty eight hours. If you want to continue conversations or look for contacts, 
the people who've been in the workshop or others with a, a broader interest in, in BPI issues, please feel free to just activate your account and then you can use it for the next 48 hours to set up bilateral conversations or swap further information and intelligence. So with that, my sincere thanks to you all once again. It's been a pleasure to moderate the lightning conversations. And I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference. The next session starts at two o'clock. So stay well. Thank you again. And bye bye for now. Thank you, Thank you very much. Bye.